Sholem Aleichem. Assalamu Alaikum. Shalom Aleichem. Okay. To start off with, let me start by saying that we need to dispel the new rumor that got started by some of the members of the AZ Anarcho Punk Block. I'm sorry. <laughs> the AZ Anarcho. Alright, sorry. <laughs> oh. Don't don't smile like that. Don't do that. Okay. <clears throat> <laughs> the AZ Anarcho punk block. No, 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 that's not right, no. Uh, I thought they were just called the Arizona Punks or something, but no. Did they really? Oh, man. Alright. Sorry, I'm sorry. <laughs> oh, alright. <laughs> Don't smile. Alright. Miriam Emmesberg and Hannah Toff are not tearing the Bundes movement apart. These rumors started by some in the AZ anarcho funk block are based on something misunderstood. Miriam Emmesberg and Hannah Toff tend to argue, not because they are not comrades, rather comrades do argue, and arguments happen in vanguard meetings commonly. Maybe anarchists need to start looking more at themselves. Sorry, instead of obsessively criticizing things not understood by those non-Jewish. Miriam and Hannah argue. So Oy vey. I hate getting in between it, Miriam and Hannah. Do you prefer that I get in between them? I mean, I, I typically get in between Marvin and Uri. But they're best friends. And roommates. But would you prefer that I get between Miriam and and Hannah. Oh my god, no! Isaiah is my hero in that regard! Oh dear. Well, Isaiah is kinda badass. Uh, sadly, in case you haven't heard, I mean, I, I don't know if it's sad or not, whether you heard it or not, but um, a Chabad synagogue uh, got shot up in San Diego on April 27th, 2019. One dead, three wounded. Now, we're not going to make any appeals to emotionalism here. We object to Chabad as being Jewish at all. However, that does not necessarily mean that we view people within the Chabad community as not necessarily Jewish, but possibly just misguided. Uh, although, we would like to make clear we object to Chabad, but that's not meant to be a sting among the victims. However, it is kind of funny that the Jewish connections, or the so-called Jewish connections that Donald Trump have, are in fact... Chabadniks. Now, what's seriously funny about that is this: this, this would play into Dr. Weisfeld's. Uh, play is probably not the right word. I, I'm having a difficult part because this, uh, this, uh, this was inserted into the script, everyone. So, but we have to address this because this is part of the same continuity of what's going on. San Diego, yeah, this sh shooting: one dead, three wounded, and um, Dr. Weisfeld had said. Uh, just recently, I mean, I gave out the four-part series. And if you want to watch the whole thing without my commentary, you can find that on Dr. Weisfeld's channel as well. And on the website. The website links to his channel and not to the commentaries that I provided. 
that I did on behest of largely Hanatov, Isaiah P. Comenstein, and and um, well, I'm not. I, I don't remember like <laughs> one of the others. It's very hard to think about a lot of this right now because it's um, it's 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 difficult to describe what we are feeling here collectively. I have to keep a satirical, sort of cynical, macabre sense of humor about a lot of things because it's very difficult to wake up in the morning and get prepared to launch a video or discuss matters knowing that here in the United States we are taught that this is the freest country in the world and the best country in the world. And when you learn the material truth behind all that, you realize that the United States of America has never once been a good country. Both the Hitlerian National Socialist Movement and the Herzlite slash Kohanist slash reincarnation of Bar Kokhba Zionist movement, you can say that they are rooted largely in Americanism. You see, the Reconstructionist um, Evangelical Restorationist Dispensational Movement which started from a group known as the Separatists, which are part of the a strand of the Puritans, this would become Americanism, which therefore Christ, which later becomes Christian Zionism, which predates therefore Jewish Zionism. Americanism created Zionism. Americanism also created National Socialism, otherwise known as Nazism. It isn't that Nazism is Zionism, or that Zionism is Nazism. More like they're both fascism. And they're both rooted in Americanism. There was nothing sacred about the, peril, the pilgrims. Nothing whatsoever. It didn't amount to anything good or decent. There isn't an entire period except maybe Justice Jackson and the Nuremberg trials. I mean, when can we point to the United States of America and ever say that it was a good country? You cannot. Not without being completely intellectually dishonest. So anyway, um, Dr. Weisfeld has meant, uh, he mentioned, you know, you can, you can watch Release Day Part 1, Part 2, Part 3, and Part 4. Or you can go to, uh, you can go to the YouTube channel, Dr. Weisfeld's YouTube channel, and listen to him talk as he's waiting for uh, Gadir to be uh, released from prison. And he talks about the history and the, the way, the, the three waves of Zionism. And he mentions the uh, the uh, white supremacist Zionist alliance. Now, we know that the so-called Jewish connection that Donald Trump has is a Chabadnik connection. No surprise, as Chabad cannot be Jewish because they only fall into two category categories. Apologism to Zionism or belief that Schneerson is the Messiah. None of those things are Jewish. And we do cut them off the nation. And if, you know, it's, it's just, it's just, you have to be really demented to not see that if we do not cut out the true heresies in the Jewish nation, we will be utterly destroyed. So anyway, that being said, it is a tragedy what happened in San Diego. We condemn that atrocity, but it is part of the continuity of what happened in New Zealand, and which that is the part of, that's part of the continuity of what happened in Pittsburgh. Why is that so crucial to understand? Well, because this gets into neocolonialism, this gets into white supremacy, and it gets into the neocolonial Zionist project in connection to the imperial white supremacist project, which is based, yes, exclusively on Western Christianity. If our primary contradiction, as Isaiah P. Comenstein has suggested, would be, in fact, the three equally, capitalism, Americanism, and Zionism. If these are our three 
primary contradictions that we evaluate to have as the Jewish people, that we evaluate in the Bundist movement, then he is also correct that these three are colonialism manifested around our sphere. Capitalism, because many of us get stuck into that, because we feel like we're up against a wall, and it's not like we have the a, the old Muslim world to protect us anymore so that we can just sit and learn Torah as we would prefer and engage in intellectual, you know, studies. Which we could do, by the way, that's the safest place for us to have done that was in the Muslim world, which has been consistently destroyed. So those days are gone. I mean, you paid your tax and... Um, the Muslims fought, and uh, you don't have to join any armies, which is actually, yes, a taboo in Judaism. It's not completely forbidden in Judaism, but it is a taboo, and we could get deep into that, but why get, th th that, that, that can be, if we have to touch upon that, we will, but we're not going to touch upon that. It's just funny that I I'm struck even more so by what Dr. Weisfeld said about the waves of Zionism and how it's Chabad that got attacked and the casualties were so low. And any casualties are terrible. But I'm almost wondering if Chabad is going to launch a campaign for all Jewish people to go to Israel. God forbid. God forbid we get assimilated and ultimately fundamentally destroyed. I mean, the plan largely is to take the Jewish people, stick them in a state, colonize them, strip away everything that we are, it's like, imagine the Borg has come and you're assimilated in and you're not you anymore. That's how you have to start thinking about Zionism. Anyway, to bring this point home, to really bring it to you, because that's what we're going to do. That's what me and Donna Newman aim to do for you, is we're going to bring this home to you. Let's be clear here. What's that was okay, thank you. We are not entirely sure the exact date of this MSNBC broadcast, but we know that this broadcast was back in nineteen eighty. We do not endorse MSNBC. What you are about to watch is a matter of public information. Pay close attention. Trying to scrape up a down payment for a little fixer-upper in your neighborhood? Take a look at my next guest. There's a reporter around Wall Street that this is what he has in mind. This is Donald Trump, 33 years old. And some people think that he wants to buy the World Trade Center, the 110-story Manhattan skyscraper that anyone can pick up if they've got the coins. Donald Trump, as I say, is just 33 years old. He took his father's rather modest by current standards real estate empire in Brooklyn and expanded it considerably. He now has an apartment for sale in a new Trump building called the Trump Tower going up on Fifth Avenue. There it is. You can buy this apartment, one floor of it, one whole floor of that building, that is, $11 million altogether. You, uh, you bought some prize properties at the bottom of the New York market in the 1970s. Uh, inner cities have been pure gold since that time. Why? Because replacement costs have just gone up so much? Well, no, not really. I had a great faith in New York. Primarily, our purchases have been in New York. And at the about five years ago, New York was not considered very hot, and cities in general weren't considered too hot. And we purchased the old Commodore Hotel, and we've reconverted that now into about a $110 million Grand Hyatt Hotel, which is opening up next week in New York City. And uh, we've made some other purchases that have been... Uh, Fine. Is that your general advice to people who are interested in real estate investment, though? Look to the inner cities, look to old buildings and doing something with them? Well, I like the inner cities. I see the inner cities as being sort of a wave of the future now. I think with the, with the problems of fuel and the gasoline shortages and everything else and the transportation, especially in the major cities such as New York and Los Angeles and Chicago, I see the inner cities as being probably, in terms of a real estate or in a real estate sense, probably the most viable investments. But it's going to be expensive. Apartments in New York City alone, one bedroom, not very large at all, $650 a month. That's tough for the working class, that's isn't right. it? And that's actually now a very low price. In fact, if you have any of them available, I'd like to make I, I know where I can sell a thousand of them at that <laughs> price. Right. Actually, that is a low that's price. Right. That's really a very low price now. They're, 
I know of uh, a couple of buildings, for instance, an Olympic Tower, which is on 51st Street and 5th Avenue apartments, are, are being rented by the condominium owners for five and $6,000 a month, and they're one-bedroom and two-bedroom apartments. So it's, uh, when you say $600, even in other sections, it's almost becoming a low price. What happens to some of the old buildings in the inner cities that are works of art? You were recently the object of a lot of controversy because you ordered destroyed some sculptures on the a building that you bought that the Metropolitan Art Museum wanted. Why did you have those destroyed, first of all, and what happens to the look of a city? Well, what we had is we, we purchased a site with an old department store on it, the old Bonwood Teller store on 5th Avenue and 57th Street next to Tiffany, and we had to really take the building down. And there were many people that didn't want us to take it down. They wanted to try and preserve the building. But the building really was not worth, as an art building or an art deco building, it really was not worth very much. And we did take it down, and there was somewhat of an outcry, but I think that's generally subsided now, and I think people like what we're doing and like the building that we're putting in its place. But couldn't you have saved just those sculptures that you had broken? Well, it would have been very, very dangerous to have saved them. They were, uh, they weighed two tons, they were 15 feet high, they were about two and a half feet thick, and if they would have fallen, they could have fallen the opposite way. If they fall into the building, you don't worry. If they fall out toward Fifth Avenue, people could have been very badly hurt and killed, and it just, to me, it was not worth it. And they've really proven not to be very valuable art structures right now, and uh, We've had appraisals done. In fact, even after the fact, we've had appraisals done, and they've turned out not to be very valuable. Mr. Trump, what's left in your life? You're 33 years old. You're worth all this money. You say you didn't say that you want to be no. worth a billion dollars. No, I really don't. I just want to keep busy and keep active and be interested in what I do, and uh, that's all there is to life as far as I'm concerned. I really am not looking to make tremendous amounts of money. I'm looking to enjoy my life, and if that happens to go with it, that's fabulous. Give me one final bottom line. In five years, the price of a hotel room in New York City will go for? It could be $1,000 a, a night. Whew. Start saving your money, folks. Just one night, $1,000. It's really good that you're not sick anymore. On October 7th, 1999, Donald Trump was on CNN's Larry King. We do not endorse CNN. However, we endorse Larry King. Pay attention to how well connected Donald Trump is to everyone. Uh, he is not in any way a deviation from the presidents that came before him. It's one of the things that we have been trying to project here. If you look at the blog that we write in, we point this out. Actually, I would say that Donna Newman completely surpasses me in this way. Well, you do, yes. I'm just louder than you, that's the thing. But, you know, uh, he's not in any way a deviation from the presidents that had come before him. He knows everyone. The collective historical amnesia. I mean, you know, it needs to stop. This, this collective historical amnesia we have. So anyway, on October... October 7th of 1999. Uh, that's when this video is. Uh, you need to watch this. Let's get into some things. The Reform Party, by its name, means reform. You will be leaving, if you run this, to, you believe in what? The Republican Party. I I'm a registered Republican. I'm a pretty conservative guy. I'm somewhat liberal on social issues, especially health care, etc. But I'd be leaving another party, and I've been close to that party. Why? Would you leave the Republican Party? I think that nobody's really hitting it right. The Democrats are too far left. I mean, Bill Bradley, <laughs> this is seriously left. He's trying to come a little more center, but he's seriously left. The Republicans are too far right. And I don't think anybody's hitting the chord. Not the chord that I want to hear, and not the chord that other people want to hear. And I've seen it. Plus, I think there's a great lack of spirit in this country. What's happened over the last four years is disgusting, and I just think there's a tremendous lack of spirit, and I think the spirit has to be brought back. Do you have a vice presidential candidate in mind? Well, I really haven't gotten quite there yet. Uh, it's I about, guess it's just, you Oprah, always... I love Oprah. Oprah would always be my first choice. Oprah. Uh, Oprah, your competitor, right? Your oh, competitor. She, Oprah's she, competitor. You know what? No she's, I'll tell you, she's really a great woman, though. She is a terrific woman. She's, she's somebody that's very special. I have not even thought about it. Um, I guess we'll see. We'll see. Maybe that's part of the whole process. Would she be some, I mean, kidding aside, that you might oh, think I mean, about? If she'd do it, she'd be fantastic. I mean, she's popular. She's brilliant. She's a wonderful woman. I mean, if she'd ever do it, I don't know that she'd ever do it. She's got, You'd ask you know, her. She'd be sort of like me. I mean, I have a lot of things going. She's got a lot of things going. What a ticket in terms that would be. Of, that would be a pretty good ticket. But she's a very exceptional woman. What makes a good president? 
Well, I think the leadership qualities, you know, the sad part about President Clinton, who, who I happen to like a lot, but he could have had a great presidency if the whole thing with uh, Monica and Paula Jones, and, and the worst of all is, you know, Linda Tripp. I mean, this woman, where she came from, I have no idea, but this is the woman from hell. But he didn't um, have anything to do with Linda Tripp. No, no, he didn't, but she always seems to surface, and she's just became a part of the administration. But can't you say, in all honesty, as Reagan asked when running against Carter, haven't you done better the last, under Clinton? You well, and Donald Trump, uh, you know what? you you've done a lot better? The truth is uh, that Reuben and Alan Greenspan and, you know, those appointments it's were on terrific, his watch. And it is on his watch. And it, the sad part is, and what I'm saying is, that he could have gone down as a really very good and so maybe a president. So you'll admit you have done well, and the country's done well. I have right? done well, and the country's done well from an economic standpoint. There's no question about that. And now you're going to see what happens over the next period of a year. Because, you know, when the election takes place, if things aren't doing well, Larry, uh, your Reform Party candidate has a major chance of doing something major. Why so you though, have to see what happens. Why does event. Gore inherit this uh, character question? Well, Gore is a man that I've said before is a very underrated man. But if he keeps going the way he's going, which has been terrible, he's no longer going to be underrated. What's he's he doing be, wrong? Nobody knows. It's just, I think he's relying on too many people. I think he probably raised too much money, and he therefore it's being taken away by too many different consultants. I mean, everybody's got a piece of him. If he'd just go back to being the regular guy that he was, I think he'd do, I mean, he got to be Vice President of the United States by being Gore. And now, all of a sudden, you have 15 people tugging on his shoulders and taking money from his various contributions. I mean, if he spent $20 million, I've spent uh, exactly $20 million less. And what do you want in a president? You said, okay, Clinton could have been a great president, not for the character issue. And you're saying the character issue... You, well, no I problem. think it's very important. I mean, Ronald Reagan, to me, was a great president. And whether you're liberal or you're conservative, people really view him as a great president. He'll go down as a great president, not so much for the things he did, just there was a demeanor to him and a spirit that the country had under Ronald Reagan that was really phenomenal. And you know, there was just a style and a class, and that's a big part of being president. I mean, that's a really big part of being president. Ronald Reagan had it. Eisenhower, now Eisenhower, I don't see him too much on lists of great, great presidents, but there was a nice time in the country. The, the country had a prestige, and he had a certain, you know, demeanor. He was a quality class act. There are certain people that have that. Unfortunately, with all of the scandal in the last four years, and, and what's happening with Gore is he's really tainted by it, and he's probably the last one to be involved in that kind of a scandal. But he's still tainted by so it. It's a tough So fair problem. or unfair, it's a fact. Well, I mean, if he were really on his game, he'd get one of his senator friends to go and run against Bradley and him so that you could divide up the anti-Clinton slash Gore vote, and he'd get in very easily, get I somebody suspect. Else At least he'd get the nomination. Strategy. Well, no, it has to be strategy, because it's not that Bradley's good. Bradley's not great. I know Bradley very well from New Jersey. I think I'm the largest employer in the state of New Jersey, and I know Senator Bradley. And, uh, you know, he was going to be thrown out of office. This guy was not going to be reelected. And then he made the statement that I'm going not to run, and the Senate is a terrible place, and everybody in the Senate said, wasn't that he didn't want to run. The guy was going to lose. He was going to lose badly. Well, Perot told us uh, back in 92 the kind of president he would be if elected, that he would be decisive, he would be uninterested in pomposity, he would be at work at 8 o'clock in the morning, these are things he would do, he didn't like, he, not a big ribbon cutter. What kind of president would Donald Trump be? Well, again, all those things are fine, but, you know, again, you go back to Reagan, and there is a certain pomposity, and there was a certain ribbon-cutting stature that is important for the president. I think that the, the you know, the whole style and look of him were, was just really... Are you saying that's the kind of person you want to well, be? Well, I, I don't say that, and I don't like to be compared to anybody, and, and maybe it would be unfair to them, to be honest with you, but uh, the president has to be a great leader, and you have to lead by example. But you need leadership in this country, and we're just not having it right now. And this is going to be Gore's problem, because he is very much associated with four very ugly years, despite an economy. I mean, if you had a bad economy at this point, it would be a disaster out there. But you do have the one thing, you have a good economy. Now this is a clip from NBC News. We do not endorse NBC, but this is public information and information on this topic is rapidly disappearing. This footage was released on August 13th of 2017.
What does today represent to you? And the camera's right here. What does today represent to you? This represents a turning point for the people of this country. We are determined to take our country back. We're going to fulfill the promises of Donald Trump. That's what we believed in. That's why we voted for Donald Trump, because he said he's going to take our country back. And that's what we got to do. Trump went to APAC, like all the others running as Republican. David Duke was fully aware of this. It has been known for a long time to those who have actively watched David Duke over the years that he consistently has helped the interests of the state of Israel. Now, let us be very clear. We do support and endorse RT. This does not make us Russian bots, people. Don't forget that Donald Trump recognized Jerusalem as the capital of Israel on December 6th of 2017. Therefore, I have determined that it is time to officially recognize Jerusalem as the capital of Israel. Both myself and Donna Newman had planned to put out this Bundes Political Awareness Trilogy. We, however, did not expect another shooting so soon. The shooting at the Chabad synagogue that took place in San Diego is already being used as a pretext by certain members of the JDL in Arizona to encourage some local Jewish communities to immigrate to Israel. The shooter's name was John Ernest. Among the four injured were two Israelis, yet they did not die, they were just injured. And I'm not trying to downplay any pain or suffering, it's just, it's interesting. This pattern is becoming very interesting, to say the least. So this may even get hyped up. Actually, this by principle of Trump and Netanyahu must get hyped up while the Pittsburgh shooting will probably get downplayed. Why? Because if it's Chabad or Messianic Jews for Jesus, that is probably going to deserve more sympathy by the white colonial Western Christian culture. It also helps to further this new crusade of Zionism. And if you're trying to be a Zionist and you're not with Messianic Judaism or Chabad, you're probably going to be on the position of Kahanism. In fact, all Zionism is becoming Kahanism because Kahanism is true Zionism, if you thought about it. That isn't a cynical position or a messed up position. It's just what it is. Don't ever forget the transfer agreement. Don't ever forget that Zionists and Nazis did cooperate. And you also have to keep in mind that Zionism is foreign to Judaism and Jewishness. A, a, per a perfect example of online provocatoring psychological operation, otherwise known as PSYOP, on the internet is this picture. This is a Photoshop, by the way. You, you can see it above. It says, Attention, anti-Zionists. Zionism is not the problem. And, you know, the NK... UK.org uh, slandering Jesus sort of stuff. But, mind you, this is Photoshopped. And you're, you're about to see that. In fact, the photo that I, this is going to switch to, you can tell, is more, more authentic. But people literally don't care. They literally don't care that this is what the real picture looks like. Now, I don't know if nobody really cares... But I would show people, and I would debunk this hoax all the time, 
and then I'd get blocked on Facebook for showing people that this was a hoax. See, this is the real picture. Don't think that COINTELPRO is not all over Facebook, all over YouTube. It It's obvious. Counterintelligence program. They want to stick all of us in Israel so that we can pay for what is being done to Palestine and so that we can be blue chips to the United States to be a permanent military foothold in the Middle East. It is as simple as that. I mean, if you're being realistic. You see what this stuff really says? Stop starving Palestinians? NKU nkuk.org you know do you see do you see what it really says this is the original photo what are the reasons why what one of the reasons why you know i kept getting blocked on facebook was because i would debunk these things people would literally be ousted um, and this is one of the reasons why I've toned down a lot of activism on Facebook particularly. Facebook is worse than dealing with YouTube. Everybody's like, oh my gosh, YouTube, you could get striked. Yes, that's true. There's a lot of terrible things that can happen to you on YouTube. And Twitter. But the worst place is Facebook. Facebook seems to have... I don't know. It, but Well, no, we do know. We all know that it's the largest part for the counterintelligence yet everybody's on there and it's the quickest way to spread information it's very frustrating i don't really think twitter's that much better except that you do less on twitter but whatever this is the original photo if you have watched our video grand news update then you know already we stand on a critical point on bernie sanders it is very uncomfortable that myself, Donna Newman, Hannah Toff, Isaiah P. Kamenstein, Miriam Emisberg, Uri Adia, and Marvin Eliyahu do not support Bernie Sanders for president. And that Donna Newman once had a plan to back Bernie only to dis only for the plan to be. I told you still once he s stabbed us in the back. Uh, Donna has dropped this plan. Don't give me that look, please. That's not funny. You should see this. So, like, this office. When we speak of this office, we're talking about a building, actually, that is rented by Donna Newman. Rented to buy or whatever. Whatever. If you want to say it, say it yourself. <laughs> whatever. <laughs> Don't do that. Anyway, so my room here with my desk and my chair is across the room from her room and her desk and chair and off of the doors are open and you should see you could see the fa her face from there <laughs> uh. <laughs> don't do that on whiteness over the course of many decades this was espoused and practiced on a spectrum running the gamut from white patronalism to white intellectual supremacy or viewing non-white populations as a detrimental force. The predecessor to neocolonialism is neoliberalism. The latter proved effective at solving the internal contradictions within white society for white society of how to square their morality with their inherently exploitative system. Neoliberalism was employed in practice on the world stage, but took on an ideological form of racism that allowed the so-called Began, Began white settler to carry on their day-to-day -day life unmolested by feelings of guilt or responsibility, and they were protected from being held accountable to the world. They were rewarded for their passive role for not fighting whiteness and at the same time benefited from the ruling from ruling the min minor operations of white institutions 
In the 1960s, a new means of shifting the revolutionary nature of colonized people in the U.S. had begun. The neo-colonial mindset was born. It posited that racism had been solved so long as the colonized peoples received tokenistic representation in the white power structure. For many years, there have been white supremacists decrying this neocolonial practice as a form of white genocide, insofar as they felt that the representation of colonized and oppressed people in their power structure is the first sign of their replacement. While this sur sur surplicious notion, this description and history of white supremacy enlightens us as to the current development in their ideology mainly that mainly what's occurring now is the mindset of the equilibrium of white supremacy and the state it is in the death throes it continues to try to adapt to its ideas it keeps trying to adapt its ideas to the growing re revolutionary consciousness of the proletariat it is attempting to escape the constant criticism of the white colonial structure as inherently exploitative and that no reform of either colonial of either and that no reform of either the colonial system nor the token participation of colonized people in it will ever absolve it from its crime or bring justice to their victims the colonial system of capitalism and racism must be overthrown, and all who participate must be indicted, and all previously considered good whites are being dethroned from their position. And the seemingly begging white settlers are now being told that in no way shall they be able to quietly have their privilege from white supremacy fly under the radar. This has warranted a reaction by the state apparatus by weaponizing the concept of whiteness as a culture, race, and national identity under threat. And we now turn to the Real News Network. The, the Real News Network. Uh, this uh, this presentation is called "Alt Right and Ultra Zionist Alliance Against National Security Advisor McMaster," and it was published on August 17th of 2017. It's the Real News Network. I'm Sharmini Pires coming to you from Baltimore. Remember Lieutenant General Herbert Raymond McMaster? He was appointed as President Trump's National Security Advisor back in February. He was then moved quickly to contain the influence of Chief Strategist Steve Bannon, whom McMaster removed from the National Security Council. If you recall, he was appointed to contain other Trump loyalists, such as Michael Flynn as well. Recently, a campaign accusing him of being anti-Israel has been waged with the support of billionaire Sheldon Adelson by a coalition of alt-right nationalists that includes Steve Bannon and extreme right-wing Zionists, such as the president of the Zionist Organization of America, Morton Klein, as well as by Israeli journalist Carleen Gleck from the Jerusalem Post. President Trump, in response to all of this, called McMaster a good man, very pro-Israel, and Israeli officials have also come forward calling McMaster friend of Israel. So on to talk about these connections and tensions is Shia Heber. Shia is a real news correspondent in Heidelberg, Germany. And uh, of course, he covers Israel and Palestine for us uh, extensively. I thank you so much for joining us, Shia. Thanks for having me, Charmaine. So Shia, President Trump is now six months into his office as president. He initially and has appointed his son-in-law, um, uh, Jared Kushner, to take up the Israel file. 
But there are these allegations flying against General McMaster. So explain to us what's going on uh, and why are these uh, individuals like uh, Sheldon Adelson even concerned about uh, how Trump is responding in terms of Israel and Israel policy? I think there's very little that uh, uh, General McMaster can actually do about Israel or against Israel. It really doesn't matter much. The only issue that has come up was the Iran nuclear deal. And I think this is going to be a decision taken directly by President Trump and not by McMaster. Um, and also, what exactly is the Israeli interest regarding the Iran nuclear deal is not so clear. Uh, obviously, uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu has a certain opinion, but other Israeli politicians have other opinions. So I think this is really a symbolic issue. Uh, there are um, people in the alt-right and also the extreme Zionism uh, who, are who are using this uh, old worn out accusation that somebody's anti-Israel in order to get their own people into the National Security Council in order to uh, exert influence on the Trump administration. And, and this coalition between extreme right uh, nationalists, white nationalists uh, in the United States uh, and um, Jewish uh, Zionists, which which traditionally were on opposing sides, uh, are now uh, working together uh, become, uh, because of, of this uh, uh, very uh, strange uh, rise of, of this alt-right. All right. Now, uh, give us a, a greater sense of the connection or the tensions uh, between these alt-right uh, organizations and uh, McMaster and Bannon, you know, map this for us. Yeah, well, uh, I've, I've been looking through the, these accusations that Carolyn Glick, uh, editor, uh, deputy editor of the Jerusalem Post, uh, and uh, Steve Bannon himself, and also uh, Morton Klein uh, of the Zionist uh, Organization of America, um, what what problem do they have with McMaster? And they made very va vague things about some statements that he made, but they couldn't put them in context that he said that Israel is an occupying power. Of course, Israel is an occupying power, but they couldn't place that statement. Uh, the only thing that they could actually, uh, uh, that their criticism boils down to, is they say McMaster is a remnant of the Obama administration. He continues the Obama uh, policies, and therefore he's not loyal to Trump. I think they, it, this is the crutch of the matter, because actually for people like Carolyn Glick, and I, and I think also for Sheldon Adelson, their relation to Trump borders on religious. Uh, they consider Trump to be uh, some kind of messiah or savior that will allow Israel once and for all to um, annex the occupied territory, expand its borders, and, the, and then the land will be redeemed. And they, they talk about this in religious terminology. But here's the problem. Trump has been president for six months now. Uh, and Israel did not annex the, the territory, did not expand its borders. In fact, it has gone from one crisis to the next. Uh, and uh, the Israeli government is not able to cement its power over the Palestinians. Palestinian resistance has not died down. So they're looking for an explanation. And the, the explanation is that something is not pure in the Trump administration. And they're pointing the finger at McMaster saying, well, because of people like him who are sabotaging Trump's own policies from the inside, uh, then, then this is preventing the Trump administration from reaching its full potential. Right. But um, obviously Netanyahu and the uh, Israeli government doesn't agree with this assessment. Uh, in fact, they have come out supporting McMaster um, as being a good uh, supporter of Israel. Uh, how does this uh, play out here? Absolutely. Prime Minister Netanyahu uh, is doing real politics and he knows that uh, there's nothing that President Trump can do that will actually uh, make Israel suddenly conquer more territory. And uh, that's not the point. Uh, Netanyahu is trying to balance a very complicated system with pressure from different sides. Uh, and uh, he uh, is a populist. Uh, and he's only in power because of his populism. Now his administration is under threat because of corruption allegations. So this is a problem for him. When people expect that the Trump administration will, will free his hands 
to, to do whatever he wants, Netanyahu suddenly has a problem because he needs to come up with a new excuse. Why doesn't he annex all the occupied territory? Um, so, of course, for him, it's not a good time to get into a fight with the Trump administration. Uh, he wants uh, to create the impression that things are happening under the surface, that he is in the know, that his friends are, are involved in this. But I think the fact that Sheldon Adelson, the big financial supporter of Netanyahu, is now uh, switching to support uh, extreme right groups that have nothing to do with the interests of the Israeli current administration, but are actually trying to push the Israeli administration to go further to, to uh, the extreme right and to annex territory, that puts Netanyahu in trouble. And I think it also spells some, some uh, clouds uh, over the uh, warm relationship between Netanyahu and Eidos. Hmm. Now, uh, coming back to this side of uh, things here in the United States, in light of the events in Charlottesville, Shia, uh, showing a direct link between the alt-right and hardcore racists uh, and neo-Nazis, why would extreme right-wing Zionist Jewish uh, organizations and individuals like Glick and Klein agree to cooperate with the alt-right in this way? I think people in the left tend to forget that just like the left considers itself to be a kind of universalist movement and that leftists around the world should have solidarity with each other, the right also has a kind of solidarity. And right, especially the extreme right. And extreme right movements in different countries consider the extreme right in other countries to be their allies. Uh, I think one of the things we saw in Charlottesville is that some of these neo-Nazi groups uh, and uh, white nationalist groups are, are big supporters of Bashar al-Assad uh, in Syria because they see him as the kind of strong leader they would like to see in the United States as well. Uh, and for people who see uh, Donald Trump talking about America first, then they're saying, OK, that's exactly the kind of administration we want to see in Israel, somebody talking about Israel first. So for Carolyn Glick or for uh, uh, Morton Klein, they're willing to accept a very heavy load of racism and even anti-Semitism against Jews uh, from the Trump administration and from its supporters in exchange for um, being allowed to copy that same kind of racism and that same kind of right-wing policy towards their uh, minorities. So just like uh, the American administration has its minorities, Muslims, Mexicans, which are being targeted, Israel also has its minorities, Palestinians uh, uh, and uh, asylum seekers, and they want those people to be targeted in the same harsh language and the same uh, harsh policies. So they're willing to take a great compromise. But I have to say the events in Charlottesville had a profound impact uh, on Israeli public opinion. And in fact, uh, there are a lot of Israelis who are very concerned about this kind of coalition. They're saying, no, there's not that much that we're willing to take in order to keep uh, the relations with the Trump administration uh, on, on good footing. And because of that, uh, the president of Israel, uh, President Rivlin, and also the education minister, Naftali Bennett, issued statements condemning uh, white nationalists and, and neo-Nazis uh, in Charlottesville. And I think Naftali Bennett, who is the head of the Jewish uh, uh, Nationalist Party uh, in Israel, uh, and he's actually of the same political camp as Carolyn Glick, as Morton Klein, when he makes that statement, a statement that shows that he, that even he thinks that they have gone too far. Hmm. Interesting analysis, Shir. I thank you so much for joining us today. And uh, uh, I guess the situation in Charlottesville is evolving, and it would be interesting to continue to keep a um, eye on what's developing here uh, against what's happening in, in Israel as well. Thank you so much. Thank you, Shamini. And thank you for joining us here on The Real News Network. We in the Bundes movement refuse to be part of the vote. We are in no way trying to marginalize Bernie Sanders supporters. In fact, there is a Socialist Party forming in Arizona that supports Bernie Sanders in the context of strategic voting. However, we, the Buddhist movement, have to recognize that any participation in the United States of America is going to destroy humanity. We will, however, stand with Sanders supporters 
on certain issues, on several issues, especially the matter of eco-socialism. Dr. Abram Weisfeld supports Bernie Sanders, a decision that everyone is disappointed with, especially Hannah Toff. That being said, both myself and Isaiah P. Kamenstein are talking to Hannah Toff about a strategy. So, although we're not going to support Bernie Sanders, we're supporting a party that does. This is all very complicated, and we're going to flush out the pros and cons to all of this. Most likely in the third and final installment, installment of this trilogy. And so, uh, we uh, take you to this uh, interview with Olin to try not to per, uh, mispronounce his full name as we hold him in the highest respect the Machika movement <clears throat> the Machika movement is a socialist organization now they probably don't I've said this before but they probably don't use the term socialist they would be classified as socialist and non-communist Gosh, we would really like to talk to the Machika movement and let them know we recognize them. We fully recognize them, and we will do whatever we can to help them. See, as Jewish people, we suffer with identity theft from the state of Israel. And one of the biggest battles we face is that there's no, there is no Jewish ethnicity or Jewish race. The Jewish nation is based on culture and religion. Mexicans are not Latino and they are not Hispanic. They are the ancient Aztec and Mayan peoples. This nation, the true Mexicans, they are not Latino, they are not Hispanic. And Olin has educated so many people. Olin Tezcatlipoca. That's the best way I can pronounce it. I don't know if that last name is Spanish or not, but this is why I've got to start learning my Spanish and my Russian and my Hebrew, my Aramaic, my Arabic. Because as a Sephardi, it's just embarrassing that I can't always pronounce these words. This interview took place on November 6th, 2016. Our editors as well. Okay, so what's today all about? Why is everyone joining? Today is about getting our people to wake up here. We're here in East LA, and Donald Trump is threatening our people. Documented, undocumented. He's already said he's for racial profiling. He, they've already done uh, these deportations of our people, the Mexican people, the indigenous people, uh, in the 1930s. For people who don't know, this is not the first time this has been attempted. He wants to deport 12 million of our people and maybe another 8 million in a oops deportation. And we, we, don't, we want to speak now because we don't want to make the same mistake that the Jews made. The Jews said we are, we are living in a civilized country. The Germans will not do that to us, even though Adolf Hitler wrote in Mein Kampf. And they were, these 6 million Jews in Europe were dead wrong for not confronting them. Adolf Hitler when they had a chance. And right now, we are speaking out against Trump to say this guy is a Nazi, this guy is a future dictator, this is a, a racist guy, this is a foul human being. And we need people to wake up to this because we're only two days away. We want to make sure that people who are also disgusting with uh, uh, Clinton don't stay home. you got to vote for the lesser evil. And the lesser evil is Clinton, and the worst catastrophe for all of us is going to be Donald Trump. Looking out, I don't see a bunch of pro-Hillary things out here. This is more of an anti-Trump movement. What do you say to that? Do you have? Are you for? Pro, are you guys mostly pro-Hillary, or is it? Is it just just a mostly keep Donald Trump away? Keep anything but Trump. We would have loved Bernie Sanders, but Bernie's not a, a, an option. If uh, for the people that that say maybe Hillary had a had a thing to do with Bernie not continuing or maybe do is there any black, bad blood as far as uh, Bernie supporters not wanting to support Hillary and maybe wanting to support Trump just because they feel betrayed by Hillary? What do you, what do you think about that? That, that would be stupid. For us to vote for Trump is stupid. This guy is a future dictator. Every indication says this guy's going to declare martial law at one point. He's going to deport people. He's going to put concentration camps. Just listen to him, his own words. You don't have to invent anything. He said it. It's documented. 
And uh, what would you say, the, the race is so close right now. Tell me, how important is this to everyone that doesn't, maybe sitting at home, it's two days away. How important is it right now? It's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's an issue of whether you want democracy in the form that we have it, because it's not a full democracy, as it is, or if you want a, a dictatorship of white supremacy. That's what the uh, options are. And if you do nothing, if you do not vote, you are, in effect, voting for Trump. Um, and my last thing to, to ask you, what do you have, what word do you have out there for people that are just waiting, that are that, that have not made their decision left or right, haven't decided which way to go? Maybe you're considering not even going out to vote. Do you have a word to them? Yeah, if, if, if you still haven't decided by now that Trump is evil in, in this campaign, if you are going to not vote, and if Trump gets in, you are going to be responsible for that dictatorship that Trump is going to bring. Cool, I appreciate it. Is there anything I didn't ask you that you'd like to put out there that I haven't specifically asked? Yeah, for, for us, uh, the Mexican, Central American, the Native American people, because that's really what he's about. Trump was not against the, the Latinos. He was very specifically aiming against the Mexicans. We're, we're indigenous people. He's not. A, he's not a concern with the white, the white Latinos. This is against indigenous people, and all we gotta do is look in the mirror, because that's who Trump is gonna come after. It's a racist thing. It's about white supremacy. It's about the destruction of our people. They are afraid of our power. The realization that white supremacy and its associated capitalist system is being marginalized is creating a reactionary current that is more vocal. And where white liberals and conservatives were pre previously docile in their personal lives, they are now having to contend with the fact that they will be rightfully disposed. No whiteness is sacred. Not among liberals, not among leftists, and not among conservatives. When confronted with reality as a means to protect their whiteness, the white leftists devolve into national Bolsheviks, Stratzerites, and social imperialists. The liberals devolve into conservatives, and the conservatives devolve into neo-Nazis, white nationalists, and Kahanist Zionists. The idea of white supremacy is inherently false. And the most obvious outcome of a dishonest ideology are reactionary ideas, employed as a last-ditch effort to save the exploitative system. If we hold the Marxian historical dialectic to be largely true, then monarchy gives way to bourgeois liberalism as a means to secure the supremacy of such a system. Why white supremacy has developed as a populist tool to secure its position. When such a bourgeois system is rightfully threatened, the most obvious evolution of their ideology is into ethno-nationalism to preserve their order. This was the case in Germany as the blatant contradictions of bourgeois, quote-unquote, democracy, quote-unquote, was being threatened. It is, doubt, it is doubled down on its populist base by espousing Nazism. But the nature of capitalism at the same time was less complex. For the United States to prevent a black and native revolution and to keep those populations intact as a labor resource, an alternative system of white supremacy was enforced, neo-colonial ideology, temporarily resolving for a time capitalism's own innate contradictions among themselves. That is, long enough for bourgeoisie to continue business as usual. Western colonialism and capitalism have always been exploitative. It is simply that their justification has evolved. With this neo-colonial mindset that was espoused in the 1960s, they were concurrently implementing a genocidal form of austerity against the colonized nations to smother revolution. The colonized and oppressed peoples were promised integration and advancement of specific classes within those nations, while the intellectual justifications of white supremacy were taught to their youths to their youths. They were preemptively suppressed to prevent revolution, but at the same time were revolutionized by those same forces of oppression and by the revolutionary predecessors among their people. Any solution made by the ruling class to stabilize the system of exploitation is always temporarily because an exploitative system 
has innate internal contradictions that will inevitably show. Knowing this, the white power structure has been grooming the white settler population into a violent form of reactionary ideology in the same way that Hitler did to ethnic Germans. In our scenario, we just happened to have had one extra step involved, that of neocolonialism and paternalistic neoliberalism. But in the course of the evolution of white supremacy, a entity of reactionary myths has evolved to square reality with their splurfous notions of supremacy, of superiority, sorry. And, res and, res and resolutions were made in their ideology to preserve the concept of white supremacy, a false notion, and then attempted to fit it into a quasi-materialistic worldview. How are they to save the environment? Ergo fascism! How are they to preserve white supremacy over the Middle East, yet keep themselves separate from Jews? By concluding... By, by being in cahoots with Zionism, so long as all Jews are sequenced, sequenced into the, shoved into the state of Israel, how can they convince Jews of this by espousing the Jewish populate by espousing to the Jewish population Kahanist Zionism? And how are they to preserve the entirety of the white race from ecological destruction by ridding the world of corporatism? Note the contradiction here, Breton Tarrant hated corporatism yet mostly was a corporatist and all these white privileged predatory people said it's not capitalism it's corporatism and they kept pointing out the supposed quote from uh, Mussolini where he says that uh, fascism should better be called corporatism because it's the merger of state and corporation and they would point to corporations being fused with the state, and yet Donald Trump is the CEO of a powerful corporation who then runs for president. And all those people who said it's corporatism, not capitalism, vote Donald Trump. It's amazing. Again, how are they to save the environment? Echo fascism. How are they to preserve white supremacy over the Middle East, yet keep themselves separate from Jews? By colluding with Zionism. So long as all Jews are sequenced into the state of Israel, how can they convince Jews of this? By espousing to the Jewish population Kahanist Zionism. How are they to preserve the entirety of the white race from ecological destruction by ridding the world of corporatism? How are they to rid the world of corporatism and yet preserve their own power? Ecofascism, with tenets of quasi-socialist outlook. Which is exactly in line with Adolf Hitler. That's why he called... I mean, think about it. National socialism is not socialism, but it has the word socialist in it. Just like anarcho-capitalism is not anarchism, yet it has the word anarcho in it. These are reactionary forces and counter-revolutionary forces. How can they retain the land that, colon that colonization has conquered by turning the charge of colonialism around on the colonized? What this does is it creates an ideological justification to work in, con in conjunction with other fascists and colonists. We now conclude with part two of a trilogy from AJ+. Plus which should explain to you the nature of neo-Nazism and the rise of white supremacy in the United States. That, that's that been creeping up for some time. This is titled, it's from AJ+, Plus, by the way. This is titled, How One Act of Violence Forever Changed the U.S. And it was published on February, February 26th of 2019. Holy cow.
Cal. About a third of the building has been blown away. This is a scene from one of the United States' deadliest domestic attacks. As we walked up, I could not believe what was happening. You really couldn't believe your eyes, and you especially couldn't believe that it was actually happening here in Oklahoma City. The bombing in Oklahoma City was an attack on innocent children and defenseless citizens. The attack came without warning, and according to a U.S. government source, told CBS News that it has Middle East terrorism written all over it. But it wasn't some foreign agent that killed 168 adults and children. This was the result of homegrown right-wing extremism. Well, am I, am I pure evil? Am I the face of terror sitting here in front of you? The Oklahoma City bombing happened years before the Charlottesville, Virginia attack. Both assaults are examples of the United States' long-running struggle with right-wing extremism and brutality. Hey fam, I'm Imayan. In part one of our series, we took a look at the rise of right-wing fanaticism in the United States and the government's response to it. Today, I'm standing at a memorial dedicated to the victims of the Oklahoma City bombing to find out what this disaster can teach us about our future. This is Oklahoma. Cowboy country. The birthplace of the legendary Mickey Mantle. And the location of the country's deadliest domestic attack committed by one of its own. Basically, there are four elements that I have to uh, uh, receive information regarding. In It's been 24 years since a moving truck filled with explosives parked near a federal building in Oklahoma City, destroying it and devastating a nation. The explosion killed 168 people, including small children, and injured 500 more. The blast was catastrophic. Half of the nine-story federal building collapsed into the street, an estimated 900 people inside. This attack is one type of far-right extremism which generally falls into two categories. Hate-based, like the neo-Nazis or white nationalists, as we discussed in part one of our series, and anti-government, like the men responsible for the Oklahoma City bombing. These are the names of the survivors of the attack that happened at 9.02 a.m. on April 19, 1995. Dennis Purefoy is one of those survivors, and we're on our way to meet him. So this is where I was sitting. The building, as you can see here, at one time I figured I was 115 feet from the bombing. That's so close to you. Yeah. That is so close. Here's how Purifoy's office looked before the explosion. Look at the date on this photo. It was taken only a few weeks before the disaster. This is what Purifoy's office building looked like after a massive truck bomb blasted off the facade of a building with a daycare center, instantly killing 100 people and trapping dozens more beneath rubble. I saw a, a flash, and I don't know if it was a reflection on the computer screen of the actual explosion, or if it was an electrical spark. Everything went totally dark and I was knocked out of my chair. That seemed to all happen at once. A ceiling tile fell on Purifoy, trapping him. A co-worker helped him escape. He suffered no major injuries, and along with a few colleagues, got to a place where they could get help. In the immediate aftermath of the bombing, there were two searches, one for the missing. This is Elijah, again, he's two, and this, this is Aaron, he's five. And one for the assailants. It was several days before I started even paying attention to who the supposed suspects were and, and that kind of thing. I was going to hospitals where coworkers were. I, and then the, after a few days, started going to funerals. 
I have the uh, obits, I think, for all of my coworkers in here. How hard was it to go to all of those funerals? Well, I, I was I, something I, I really wanted to do. I wanted to be at every one. One reason that it was hard is that there were sometimes multiple ones on the same day. The earliest news coverage quickly speculated so-called Middle Eastern terrorism. But the bombers weren't a group of brown people from far off places. They were homegrown, far-right militants motivated by their hatred of the federal government. This is what the bombers actually looked like. I think I was kind of in shock, like most people were. What, what would possess Timothy McVeigh, who was an Army veteran, why would he do such a thing? And this was during a period where the U.S. had seen several violent far-right acts. The bombing attack shares the same date as the Waco siege. And Olympic bomber Eric Rudolph planted an explosive at the Atlanta Games in 1996. The news media failed to link these stories in the same way they so eagerly do with so-called Islamic extremist acts. How much did you know about far-right extremism before Oklahoma City? Really nothing. I hadn't paid attention to it. It hadn't been, been in the news. Before the bombing, I really didn't know the extent of far-right extremism in the country. Once I became aware of it, I tried to let other people know. I talked about it. I talked about it at church. Um, I didn't, I don't know that I was on a crusade, but I, I was definitely interested in more people learning about it and being aware about it. The plot Timothy McVeigh and Terry Nichols concocted is eerily similar to one that a trio of white men had hoped to execute the day after the 2016 presidential election in Garden City, Kansas. The militiamen, who dubbed themselves the Crusaders, schemed to kill as many Somali refugees as possible by detonating four car bombs outside an apartment complex that also doubled as a mosque. They were planning to blow up this community in Garden City uh, with Timothy McVeigh style truck bombs, situate themselves at the exits to the community with machine guns and shoot anybody who tried to flee. So it was gonna be a horrible massacre. This is David Nywert. And the reason he knows so much about what happened in Kansas is because he's been studying far-right extremism in the U.S. since the 1970s. A judge sentenced those three Kansas men to 25 to 30 years in jail. And their plot shows something Nywert says the nation has forgotten. People understood prior to 9-11 that terrorism could take a variety of shapes. After 9-11, the only kind of terrorism that people thought of were essentially Arabs and Muslims. Today, we've had a national tragedy. Two airplanes have crashed into the World Trade Center in an apparent terrorist attack on our country. Bush's focus was on threats coming from overseas. His so-called war on terror didn't address far-right figures like McVeigh, Nichols, or Rudolph but we're gonna smoke them out. Our mission is to battle terrorism and to join with freedom-loving people. This is a long-term battle, war. And while President Bush literally said Islam is peace to make a distinction between religion and acts of terror, the country's focus on Iraq and Afghanistan meant that the far-right threat that so recently had its attention faded from its collective memory. While the United States was focused on Al-Qaeda and Muslims, far-right hate was organizing and energizing. Unfortunately, uh, America, a lot of times, our legislators and even law enforcement to some degree, are reactive. Uh, something significant has to happen in order for people to actually do something about the problem. Former Department of Homeland Security analyst Daryl Johnson watched as far-right extremism became a bigger threat to the country particularly after Donald Trump was elected. 
So typically during Democratic administrations, like Obama administration, Clinton administration, we see a rise of the far right. And then typically during Republican administration, we see just the opposite. But this time, in 2016, we had a Republican administration come into power and the far right has continued to operate at a heightened level, which goes against all the trending that I've seen over the past you know, 30 to 40 years. Johnson and Nightworth both believe the president's heated rhetoric has mainstreamed extremist messages. And Nywert says President Trump has soft-pedaled a version of white nationalism and made it more palatable for a wider audience. The people who were committing these crimes were either referencing Trump's name directly, like shouting Trump, 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 as they beat people up or threaten people, or using his um, name to say, you know, well, Trump's going to get you out of here. This problem didn't start with Donald Trump. He took advantage of it, but he definitely fueled it. And it's massively expanded because of his presidency. And yes, we will build the wall. We've already started planning. It will be built. Nywood says there's a thread he's seen connect the philosophy of far-right extremism to its believers. The personality type that is drawn to these movements consistently is what we call right-wing authoritarians. Authoritarian personalities are basically people who want to be told what to do. People who want an authoritarian rule because they feel more safe and secure. This is the role that Trump plays. This isn't the first time that this has happened. The country's history is littered with examples of far-right extremism being overlooked, ignored, and sometimes even being turned into government policy. Think of all the violence associated with Jim Crow. How worried are you that people will forget Oklahoma City, that it'll fade from the memories? I think as time goes on, it will start fading from memory a little bit, but it is, it's still, even to this day, it's the largest domestic terrorism as far as number of casualties in the United States. I, I hope that we remain, for many years to come, the still the largest domestic terrorism incident in our history. We can't anymore just say, it's not my business. I, 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 I can't pay attention to all that. It is our business, and we have to pay attention to it. Right now, the nation is at a place where it's been before in confronting right-wing fanaticism. And it's making some of the same decisions it's made before in governmental policies, and in news coverage. See, the governmental response isn't the only thing contributing to this problem. The news media, they have culpability too. Both Purefoy and I would say, part of the reason people don't see far-right extremism as a threat is because of how the news media has and continues to portray it. I think, I think they should report more in depth. So unless you get, unless the new media provides some background, people really do remain late pretty much ignorant about it. The book that inspired Timothy McVeigh, it's been inciting far-right violence for decades. Timothy McVeigh, he would try to convince people for months and months and months, his circle of friends, he tried to convince them, he tried to get them to read the Turner Diaries and stuff like that. The Turner Diaries is a racist, dystopian novel written by a neo-Nazi leader. The book reached the pinnacle of its popularity in 1995 once a connection to Timothy McVeigh was made. But there's something 1995 didn't have which may have limited its reach. Widespread, high-speed internet. The internet and social media revolutionized how right-wing extremism met, grew, and conspired. And that's really important because not all right-wing extremism is created equal. It can be found in even the most liberal of places. There's people you won't know. You're trained to blend in with your community. Hey fam, thanks so much for watching. Don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. One of the things that was the most intriguing to me at the Oklahoma City Memorial were the two gates that they have. There's one at 901 symbolizing the city's innocence before the bombing, and then there's a gate symbolizing 903 one minute after the bombing and what happens to Oklahoma City afterward. Be sure to stay tuned for the third and final part of our series and we'll see you next time. Thanks for watching.